Hi there. My name is David Warner Matheson, and for decades I've been searching for the Lost Ark. Here I am in the 1980s discussing the Ark's location with a colleague. The Ark of the Covenant of the Lord is, of course, one of the most sacred and awe-inspiring artifacts described in the ancient Hebrew scriptures. Its identity and possible location have been the subject of serious research and examination for centuries. And this is not a misguided effort. I believe that the Ark can, in fact, be found, and that it's very beneficial to seek to know more about it. But I'm convinced that many of the efforts to find it are doomed to failure because they're digging in the wrong place. That is, because they're interpreting the ancient scriptures as if the texts are describing literal and terrestrial history. In fact, overwhelming evidence supports the conclusion that the stories in the texts that make up what we call the Bible are describing events that take place in the infinite realm of the heavens. And so are virtually all the other ancient myths, scriptures, and sacred stories around the world. In order to understand the profound and powerful lessons they have for us. It helps to listen to them in the language that they are actually speaking, the language of the stars. The pattern of the Ark is described in the scroll of Exodus, in the chapters we call Exodus 25 and also Exodus 37. Its dimensions are to be two cubits and a half the length thereof, and a cubit and a half the breadth thereof, and a cubit and a half the height thereof, overlaid with pure gold within and without, with a crown of gold round about, and four rings in order to bear it with staves two rings on either side of it. The ark is also described as having a mercy seat of pure gold, two and a half cubits the length thereof and a cubit and a half the breadth thereof. And in the two ends of the mercy seat, two cherubim stretching forth wings on high, covering the mercy seat with their wings. And the text says, their faces shall look one to another Toward the mercy seat shall the faces of the cherubim be. When Joshua is instructed to lead the people across Jordan into the promised land, in the scroll of Joshua, in the parts we usually describe as chapters 3 and 4, he is commanded to have the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord go over before the multitude into the Jordan, and as soon as the soles of the feet of the priests that bear the Ark of the Lord shall rest in the waters of Jordan, the waters of Jordan shall be cut off from the waters that come down from above, and they shall stand in a heap. When the angel tells Joshua what he must do to bring down the walls of the city of Jericho, in Joshua chapter 6, he is told to have the priests take up the ark and bear before the ark seven trumpets of ram's horns, encompass the city seven times, blowing with the trumpets. And when we read the description of the ark going up into the city of David in 2 Samuel chapter 6, we're told that David and all the house of Israel played before the Lord on all manner of instruments, even on harps and on psalteries, which is a stringed instrument like a lyre or a zither, and on timbrels and on cornets or trumpets, and on symbols. Here's another version of that same scene. King David in front of the ark playing on a harp. And then here's a trumpet in front of him and another person playing on a trumpet. And in that same chapter, we also read that Uzzah 
put forth his hand to the ark of God and took hold of it to steady it, and that the Lord smote him there, and he died. There are other passages we could examine, but with these we have sufficient textual clues to begin to identify the ark that these sacred texts are describing, the ark which is located in the infinite realms themselves, the infinite realm of the heavens above. We're going to examine a variety of clues that indicate that the Ark of the Covenant is associated with the constellation Ophiuchus. This is the outline of the constellation Ophiuchus, and you can see the boxy shape with the triangular top, and on either side, the serpent that Ophiuchus is holding, the name Ophiuchus means the serpent bearer, can also be envisioned as the priests who are holding the ark or bearing the ark between them with staffs. Ophiuchus is often described as a warrior carrying two spears, such as in the Iliad. And you can see that Ophiuchus is often a figure that has two of something on either side of it. You can see that the outline of the ark in some of the artistic depictions is very close to what we see in the sky with the constellation Ophiuchus. We'll talk more about that later. Next, let's take a look at the identity of the cherubim, which are described as being in the mercy seat on top of the ark. This is the constellation directly above Ophiuchus. It's the constellation Hercules. Now, Hercules is a constellation that appears to be a powerful figure with a large club or a mace or sword over his head. But in some ancient depictions, that large weapon can actually be envisioned as a wing or the wings of an angel or an angelic figure. Now look at the outline of Hercules, notice the positioning of the legs, and now look at this ancient Greek vase from about 450 BC, and you can see the winged figure located right behind the charioteer. Now the charioteer in this case is Achilles, dragging the corpse of Hector from a scene that's described in the Iliad, but the charioteer actually corresponds to a constellation we'll meet later called Boötes, and Boötes is right in front of the constellation Hercules, and that winged figure corresponds precisely to the constellation Hercules, but that large club, what the part of the constellation that's usually envisioned as his club or his sword or his mace, in this case is being envisioned as a pair of wings. So a likely identification for the cherubim on top of the Ark of the Covenant, which corresponds to Ophiuchus, is the constellation Hercules. And there are many other places in the scriptures and ancient myths in which Hercules plays an angel-like figure. Here are some depictions of the Annunciation, which is found in the Gospels. The angel Gabriel comes to the Virgin Mary, and the angel Gabriel corresponds to the constellation Hercules, and in this case the Virgin Mary corresponds to the Virgin in the sky, the constellation Virgo. You can see the same wing, the same deep knee bend posture in these depictions of the angel Gabriel that correspond to the constellation Hercules in the sky. Here's one from Botticelli. That outstretched arm is very characteristic of the constellation Virgo, and that posture of the angel is very characteristic of the constellation Hercules. And here's one from Leonardo da Vinci. Again, characteristic outstretched arm of Virgo, characteristic deep knee bend posture of Hercules, and the arcing 
wings over his back. All of this is cited as supporting evidence for my assertion that the cherubim atop the ark corresponds to the constellation Hercules. But what about the part of the text that says very clearly that the cherubim are face to face with one another? There are actually two other glorious winged figures in the heavens right next to Ophiuchus, right nearby next to Ophiuchus and Hercules. And those two winged figures are actually facing towards one another, face to face. And those are the constellations of the swan and the eagle. They're called Cygnus and Aquila. Cygnus, the swan, and Aquila, the eagle. And they are flying towards one another and they're just glorious in the night sky. They're much larger in real life than they seem in this planetarium app on your screen. And they're flying towards one another with their wings outstretched in the band of the Milky Way, the dazzling band of the Milky Way. And I believe that it, this in some way also corresponds to that solid gold mercy seat where the Most High dwells between the outstretched wings of the two cherubim and that solid gold mercy seat somehow corresponds to the glorious milky way that's in between the outstretched wings of these two figures and in fact as i discuss in some of my other writings such as volume three of star myths of the world which is called star myths of the bible there is a lot of evidence that the constellation hercules sometimes does correspond to the figure of the Most High. So you can see that the Most High does indeed dwell between the two cherubim and their outstretched wings if Cygnus and Aquila are also considered as part of the role of that scene on top of the Ark of the Covenant in the heavens. And just to add a little bit of additional supporting evidence to this interpretation, I've noted in many places before, including in Star Myths of the World Volume 1, that the depictions of the winged goddess Isis from ancient Egypt, when she is depicted as winged Isis, she is sometimes depicted in a kneeling position that corresponds to the outline of the constellation of the swan in the heavens. And if you look at traditional depictions of the cherubim on top of the Ark of the Covenant, they also are very reminiscent of the kneeling winged Isis. And that supports the argument that they are related to the outstretched wings of the constellations Aquila and Cygnus in the sky. Now we saw that in the passage from Joshua chapters 3 and 4, the crossing of the Jordan, that when the priests bearing the Ark of the Covenant, when the soles of their feet touched the Jordan, then the waters would be cut off and they would stand in a heap so that the people could cross into the promised land on dry ground. Now take a look at the constellation Ophiuchus in relation to the glorious band of the Milky Way galaxy, that heavenly river of stars. And you can see that the foot, uh, one of the feet of the constellation Ophiuchus is in the Milky Way. And this corresponds to, or this gives rise to that passage in the scripture about the priests carrying the Ark of the Covenant to Jordan and then the Jordan standing up in a heap. There is actually a passageway through the Milky Way at this very point. And it's actually a dark band through that brightest part of the Milky Way. It's called the Galactic Rift or the Great Rift. And this is actually the widest and brightest part of the Milky Way. So let's actually just zoom in on the Milky Way itself and I'm going to brighten it up a little bit here 
and you can see that dark band. This is the widest and brightest part of the Milky Way, and it's right next to Ophiuchus in between Sagittarius and Scorpio, and that dark band is envisioned in many myths around the world as a passage across a river or the crossing of the Red Sea that happens in the book of Exodus. But it's also found in North American sacred stories. Anyway, you can see it right here. I've marked it out and there's the outline of Ophiuchus again. So you can see for perspective and there's the outline of the Milky Way. And I think you can see from this planetarium diagram why the passage in Joshua 3 in verse 13 says that it shall come to pass as soon as the soles of the feet of the priests that bear the ark of the Lord shall rest in the waters of Jordan, the waters of Jordan shall be cut off from the waters that come down from above and they shall stand upon a heap. The waters below stand in a heap because that's the widest and brightest part of the Milky Way, but they're cut off as soon as the soles of the feet touch the Milky Way. They're cut off from the waters that are coming down from above by that galactic rift, that passage that goes across. You could draw it, uh, you know, there's a little bit of discretion as to exactly where you draw that uh, passage going across, but it cuts off the waters that are coming down from above from the waters that are down below and they appear to be standing in a heap and that's why the ark and the people are able to cross over on dry ground across the Jordan just as happened going across the Red Sea when Moses put out his staff. Now after they cross the Jordan and enter into the promised land they encounter the city of Jericho, the walled city of Jericho, and Joshua is instructed to have priests going before the Ark of the Covenant and blowing on trumpets made from ram's horns. And you'll see that going in front of Ophiuchus, there are two constellations that probably correspond to these trumpets, the priests blowing the trumpets. There's the constellation Belodes, the herdsman, and Belodes is a very large constellation, and he appears to be seated and smoking a pipe or blowing a trumpet. You can see that trumpet uh, coming out of his mouth. This is the outlining system of H.A. Ray, the author of the Curious George books, along with his wife Margaret. This is the outline of the constellation Belodes with a pipe or in many myths, that pipe plays the role of a trumpet. And right behind Boötes, in between Boötes and the constellation Hercules that we just talked about, is this curved, beautiful constellation called Corona Borealis, the northern crown. It's a very beautiful curve. It looks like a necklace or a crown in the sky, but that could also, could also be envisioned as a curving horn. That is the ram's horn that the priests in front of the Ark of the Covenant, the constellation Ophiuchus, are blowing, are instructed to sound as they go around to bring down the walls of Jericho. Now there's another important musical instrument that is mentioned in conjunction with the Ark of the Covenant, and that is when the Ark is being brought into the city of David and David is dancing in front of the ark. He's in the procession of the ark, and he is playing his harp or his lyre. Now, I'm not going to go into it in this video, but there's an overwhelming amount of evidence that supports the conclusion that the constellation Hercules is also associated with the figure of David. And I, t I do talk about that in Star Myths of the Bible. But just like an actor on the stage or in a movie, sometimes these constellations will play many different roles. And the constellation Hercules does correspond to the figure of King David. And right next to the constellation Hercules, there is his musical instrument. You know, David is the sweet singer of Israel. He plays on a lyre. And right next to 
the constellation Hercules is the constellation Lyra, the lyre. And so there are many figures in, in different myths from around the world where a bard or a singer uh, uses a harp and that figure is associated with Hercules and right next to Hercules is this figure of the lyre or the harp. So here you can see the harp in front of the ark carried of course by David and then the trumpets in front of the harp. And this order of march and the shape of those trumpets corresponds very nicely to the constellations in the night sky. Now I said I'd come back to the reason why I believe that the shape of Ophiuchus is what is described in the passage in the scripture that talks about putting a crown around the uh, at the top of the Ark of the Covenant, the same shape that you see in this picture here. In Exodus 37, where the actual construction of the Ark is described, the passage says that there would be a crown on top of the Ark. And then a little bit later, the same chapter, Exodus 37, is describing some of the other temple furniture that is being constructed. And in Exodus 37 and verse 10, it describes the making of the table, which is two cubits, the length thereof and a cubit, the breadth thereof and a cubit and a half, the height thereof overlaid with pure gold, and a crown of gold round about. Now the identity of this table that's beside the Ark of the Covenant, I am convinced, is the constellation, the zodiac constellation of Libra. And you can see that Libra also has a triangular top, just like Ophiuchus. And both of them are described in the scriptures as having a crown. The Hebrew word is actually zair, Z-R. It's like a collar. It's described as a collar or a, uh, a crown. So this word is can be interpreted in different ways, but both the table and the ark are described as having a crown. And take a look at the shape of Libra and Ophiuchus. They both have the same shape of a crown or triangle on top. And in the same chapter, we get the description of the sacred candlestick right after the description of the table or a few verses afterwards. We hear the description of the sacred candlestick with six branches. And I'm convinced that that corresponds to the outline of the constellation Scorpio which is often described as having multiple heads, sometimes three heads, sometimes seven heads, eight heads, nine heads, and in this case, six branches to the candlestick. And you can see uh, here is the beautiful fish hook shape of the body of Scorpio, and then the five bright stars, I've numbered them around the outside that you can see in the diagram, one, two, three, four, five, and the sixth, I believe in the center would correspond to the, constel uh, the constellation's brightest star, Antares. So there's the six branches of the sacred candlestick that's described right after the sacred table and the ark itself. Another confirmatory detail from the texts that shows that we're on the right track with this interpretation is the account of Uzzah or Uzzah in Second Samuel chapter 6, when the ark is going up to the city of David, and Uzzah puts out his hand to steady the ark, um, and he's struck down. The figure of Hercules can be seen to be reaching down towards the ark, and this is most likely the inspiration in the sky for that terrifying account of Uzzah reaching out to touch the ark and then being struck down by the Lord. And probably when he's struck down, uh, the constellation Virgo plays the role of Uzzah uh, when he's lying at the, uh, you know, at the, on the ground before the ark. And you can see that uh, distinctive outstretched arm of Virgo that I mentioned a little bit earlier. Now there's yet one more confirmatory detail that I'll mention here. 
and it's really amazing. And that has to do with the fall of the city of Jericho. And really quickly, I'm going to show you, I believe that the city of Jericho, in fact, I'm certain that the city of Jericho corresponds in the sky to the great square of Pegasus, the walled city of Jericho, the mighty great square of Pegasus, and the wall around it is Pegasus, the fish of Pisces, the fishes of Pisces. I've drawn in Pisces in light blue there. So that's the fishes of Pisces and the red square, of course, is the great square of Pegasus. Actually, this figure of the great square plays the role of a powerful fortified city in many different myths, including in the Iliad, it plays the role of Fair Ilium, or the city of Troy, as I discuss in Star Myths of the World, Volume 2. But, so, the Great Square is much bigger in the sky. I've zoomed way out here to show you what happens, what's rising when Jericho is falling to the ground, that is to say, when Jericho is setting. Now, everyone who's viewing this should probably already be aware that the stars rotate across the sky from east to west just like our sun. They rise in the east, they set in the west. So I've zoomed way out. The great square is actually much bigger when you see it in the night sky with when you're actually, if you're able to go out and see it for yourself. But here's the great square and Pegasus and it's gonna to rotate towards the right side of your screen because in this uh, stellarium, we are looking towards the south and seeing the great square. So East is actually to our left, and west is actually to our right because we're facing south. So the stars are going to arc across the sky, rising up from the left side of our screen and setting down uh, in the right side of our screen, which is west. And now we'll just do a little bit of time lapse, and we'll continue to advance the hours, and as the Earth rotates on its axis and we rotate towards the east everything in the sky will appear to speed towards the west and as we rotate towards the east we see that the great square and pisces begin to sink down towards the west and in this frame you should be able to see as the corner of the great city is touching the western horizon as the square of Pegasus is about to start to set below the horizon. What do you see rising up in the east? But the trumpet of Boötes, the trumpet of the priests that are walking before the ark to cause the walls of the city of Jericho to fall down. And there goes Jericho. There goes the great square of Pegasus sinking down into the west in other words falling down level to the ground and as jericho is falling down Boötes, which we said was one of the uh, constellations that plays the role of the priests walking in front of the ark of the covenant blowing the trumpet is rising up out of the east and that is powerful confirmation that we were correct in our analysis of the constellation Boötes as the trumpet that uh, the trumpet bearing priests walking before the ark and that helps to confirm the entire analysis of Ophiuchus as the ark of the covenant and all the other details that we were just discussing. So what does this mean? Does it mean that the ancient scriptures are not true? Quote true? No, it does not mean that at all. It means I am firmly convinced that the ancient scriptures are not literal and that they are not terrestrial. That is describing things that happen here on the surface of the earth any more than any of the other ancient myths of the world and sacred traditions of the world are literal in nature. They are celestial and they can be shown to be using the same celestial system of metaphor and speaking the same celestial language the world over. 
And if the events they are describing take place in the sky and not on the earth in terrestrial history, then they cannot be said to be describing history that belongs to this or that literal group of people. And thus they should not be used to divide this group of people from that group of people or to say that this group of people is somehow better than that one due to being descended from this or that set of characters in the ancient myths. If the world's ancient sacred stories describe the motions of the heavenly cycles, then we clearly cannot say this group is descended from that character or that group of characters. If those characters can be shown to be constellations or metaphorical descriptions of the motions of a certain set of stars in a certain part of the heavens. On the contrary, as Alvin Boyd Kuhn said in his lectures and his writings, these stories are actually about each and every man and woman. They are about the experience of each and every human soul. The story of the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord can be shown to take place in the heavenly realm. And as I have explained in some of my writings, the heavenly realm is a representative of the infinite realm, the realm of spirit. The motions of the stars through the night and through the year causes them to rotate down out of the heavenly realm to sink into the earth at the western horizon. Just as each and every human soul can be said to come down out of an infinite realm into this manifest realm where for a time we're encased in a human body. We take, we manifest a form. The ark is a picture of the same thing. The infinite encased in an ark that's born up by human beings. It crosses through the waters of Jordan just as we cross through this lower realm in a human body that's seven-eighths of which is composed of water. We ourselves, like the ark, are passing through Jordan. A divine, infinite soul bounded for a time within the arc of our physical form, traversing the lower realm of earth and water. And yet, even while we are here in this lower realm, we have access to the infinite at all times, access to the holy realm, to the divine realm, because the arc where the Holy One dwells is actually a true picture of each and every one of us. This truth is very easy to forget. It's very easy to lose, so to speak. That's why it's the lost ark. It's very easy to forget that you yourself and everyone that you will ever meet has an infinite connection, a connection to infinity right inside at all times, readily accessible to you, but encased within a limited physical form while crossing this lower realm. But as we begin to understand the ancient myths and scriptures in the language that they're actually speaking, these amazing sacred stories point us back in the right direction. And now that you know how to find the actual ark, the eternal ark, that's described in the ancient scriptures, you can see it for yourself and realize that it is given to each and every one of us for our blessing and benefit in this incarnate life.